In this video, we're going to look at the different uh, relationships between currents and voltages in the BJT transistor. We'll look at the effects of the um, voltage across the PN junctions, as well as the voltages across the collector to emitter terminals, and um, also the terminal currents I sub C, I sub B, and I sub E. As we've seen, the BJT transistors are fundamentally different than field effect transistors. Although they both have three terminals and, as we will see, both can be used to provide amplification and switching, their structures and mechanisms are fundamentally different. BJTs are based around the PN junction and use the current voltage relationship at the PN junction to create a dependent source. The collector current is a function of the junction voltage VBE. As we've seen, all three of the terminal currents, I sub C, I sub B, and I sub E, are exponentially dependent on VBE, and they differ only by a scaling factor. Thus, the graph of every one of those currents with respect to VBE will display the general form of this graph here. We recognize this graph as the graph of the diode current as a function of the voltage across the diode. We also observe the temperature dependence of the device. So as you'll recall, when we studied diodes, for a very small uh, voltage across the diode, there was no noticeable current going through it. But at some point, great enough to overcome the junction voltage, the reverse junction voltage, we then saw large, in fact, exponentially increasing current values as VBE, or in the diode case, the voltage across the diode made small changes. We see basically that same characteristic here in these graphs, because once again, the currents are functions of the currents, meaning the, um, the terminal currents, are functions of VBE, exponential functions of VBE, just like the diode, because again, and I'm repeating myself, they um, are related to that PN junction. And we notice here also that as the temperature increases, the graphs shift for two reasons. One, I sub S, the saturation current, doubles every five um, doubles every five degrees C rise in temperature, and then also VBE, the voltage, the base emitter voltage, the voltage across the PN junction, decreases about two millivolts every uh, degree centigrade as the temperature increases. We've discussed the different modes of operation. We've talked about the saturation region and also the active region of the transistor. Underlying the active mode, relationships between the terminal currents we have derived, let me say that again, in the active mode, underlying the, the uh, terminal currents that we've derived is the assumption that in general, these currents are not affected by changes in the collector to emitter voltage. But that isn't exactly correct. In reality, for a BJT in the active mode, as the reverse bias voltage of the collector base junction increases, the current I sub C increases slightly. So here, up until now, we've talked about the current, the collector current, being basically constant as far as changes in the collector to emitter voltage was concerned. But in reality, there is a slight increase in the collector current as VCE increases. To understand this phenomenon, Recall that as we saw when deriving the formula for I sub C, the saturation current I sub S was inversely proportional to the width of the base. The narrower the base of the transistor, the larger I sub S was. So for our current topic, as VCE increases, increasing the reverse bias voltage, increasing the reverse the reverse bias voltage on the collector to base PN junction. As that reverse bias increases, the depletion region of the base collector junction increases. Let me say that again. The depletion region increases, effectively narrowing the width of the base and increasing I sub S. We can see this by looking at these two graphs flat, suggesting no increase, but in reality there is an increase, and each of these different lines corresponding to a set value of VBE has a finite slope to it.
In the first graph, each of the lines corresponding to a different bias are parallel. But in this graph here, these lines are no longer horizontal and they're also not parallel. As I think I've already mentioned, this family of curves here is produced by setting VBE, setting the voltage across the base to emitter junction and then varying the collector to emitter voltage and measuring I sub C. Thus each line corresponds to a different VBE. And you can see that as VBE increases, the slope increases. If you project those lines, non-parallel lines, out to the point that they intersect, um, we see that they intersect at a point that we've labeled here negative V sub A. This effect is analogous to the channel length modulation we saw in the pinch-off region of MOSFETs. As with field effect transistors, this effect is known as, this phenomenon is known as the early effect and manifests itself as a slight increase in I sub C as VCE increases when the transistor is in the active mode. Once again, V sub A is referred to as the early voltage. And mathematically, we can account for this, um, this phenomenon by multiplying the equation for I sub C, which we derived previously, by this term 1 plus VCE over V sub A. So much like we did with FETs, we took the, where we took the I sub D term and multiplied it by a 1 plus lambda term. Here we're taking the, if the equation for the current, I sub C, and multiplying it by this term here such that at VCE equaling negative V sub A, or VCE equaling negative V sub A, the expression here um, goes to zero, or this, this term drives the current I sub C to zero. Now, of course, it doesn't mean anything to have a VCE with a negative. That, that we would never do that. That doesn't, no, no telling what the transistor would do. It's simply a point in the graph that corresponds to the vertical intercept of this graph. And mathematically, it becomes significant. Now, to account for this in our models, we describe a resistor R0 equal to 1 over the slope of these, the line at, uh, for a given VBE. So you choose your bias point, the VBE bias point, and then the uh, the slope, or the, the, the slope of this line, I guess the inverse of the slope, one over the slope of this line, is then this quantity, uh, R0. So 1 over R0 is defined as the partial derivative of I sub C with respect to VCE for a given VBE. And it turns out that that value then is equal to V sub A, the early voltage, divided by I sub C, the bias current, or the DC value of the current. In the large signal or DC models of the field of, or of the BJT, R0 is connected in parallel with the current source and accounts for the fact that there is some slight increase in current as VCE increases. The fact that it doesn't increase very much suggests that R0 is going to be a relatively large value, but not infinite. It turns out that there isn't much effect on our calculations dealing with biasing the transistors. R0 really doesn't affect our DC calculations that much. So generally, we'll ignore it while doing those DC calculations. But it is real, and it will turn up again in the small signal models we'll develop for our AC analysis. In the previous slide, the family of curves corresponding to setting the va corresponded to setting the value of VBE. Each curve corresponded to a different constant value of VBE. Well, another way of, of uh, expressing the transistor voltage current characteristics is by, instead of setting VBE, we can set the current I sub B. And measuring the effect of I sub C for changing values of VCE. As you can see, the shape of the curves is very similar to those we saw when setting VBE.
But this set of curves is useful for determining beta, the current gain of the transistor, both beta as we've seen it, and then also another quantity called the incremental beta. Now, the incremental beta is defined as, and we'll call it beta incremental, is defined as the change in I sub C for a change in I sub B. So graphically what we're talking about is the change in current that we experience going from one line to another line in this family. This is an expanded, this is the same graph as this, just a little bit larger. So we can calculate the, um, for a given value, and again this applies only in the active region, at least, let me, let me back off that statement because we're going to talk about an incremental um, beta in the saturation region also. So let me just say that in general when we're talking about beta, not the forced beta, but just beta, it applies to the active region and we can calculate that by just extending lines over, measuring the change in current for change in I sub C corresponding to two different values of I sub B. It turns out that this incremental beta is very close to the beta that we get when we just have defined beta is equal to I sub C over I sub B, the bias I sub C and the bias I sub B, that current gain that we've, we've been using. It turns out that these two values are very close to the same, and especially for what we're going to be doing, we're not going to make a distinction between the two. Another BJT transistor parameter of interest relates to the resistance of the transistor in saturation. The steepness of the slope of these curves in saturation suggests a relatively small resistance which is consistent with a relatively small voltage across the transistor in saturation. So f again, for a given I sub B, and the voltage here, what we're, we're referring to here is the saturation voltage. Calculating the slope of the line at the point that the saturation voltage intersects the I sub B curve of interest, we can calculate that slope and one over that slope is what is known as the RCE sat or the saturated resistance of the transistor. And as I mentioned, it's relatively small, which is consistent with our understanding that when we're talking about the saturation voltage across here, it's a relatively small value between 0.1 and 0.3 volts. Thus, we wouldn't expect the resistance across there to be very small, and that's consistent with the fact that this slope, which is one over the resistance, is relatively steep.